We'll begin this segment of our Chapter 18 presentation by introducing you to the magical world of acetylides, which are really just al terminal alkynes that have been deprotonated, as shown here. What is the mechanism of this? Well, we treat an alkyne with NaNH2, which is often known as sodamid. NaNH2 you can think of as just being a minus charge on the nitrogen. The electrons come in, grab the terminal hydrogen, and thrust these electrons onto that carbon, giving my, me my negatively charged terminal alkyne. These types of compounds, acetylides, can react with aldehydes and ketones, as shown here. Minus charge on the carbon comes into the carbonyl carbon, thrusts these electrons up onto the oxygen, and gives me this intermediate. When we protonate that oxygen with an acid source, we then get this kind of alcohol, which is really cool. It's a secondary alcohol that has an alkyne adjacent to it. I should tell you that the proton source that I stole from your book here is actually pyridinium, but you can use other acids as well. We'll now address the addition of hydride to aldehydes and ketones. Before beginning, I want to remind you of something I mentioned back in chapter 16. One way to quickly spot a reduction reaction in organic chemistry is to see if a molecule has gained bonds to hydrogen. If it has, then we can usually say that the molecule has been reduced. The hydride reactions that I'm going to show you on this slide involve using sodium borohydride, NaBH4, and reacting it with an aldehyde or a ketone. If you treat an aldehyde with sodium borohydride and then follow it with an ethanol or acid quench, it will convert an aldehyde into a primary alcohol. By comparison, if you take a ketone and treat it with sodium borohydride followed by ethanol or acid quench, it will make a secondary alcohol. What is the mechanism of this reaction? Well, you have to remember that sodium borohydride really is a source of hydride, H minus. So when we take our aldehyde or ketone starting materials, we can imagine treating them with sodium borohydride as being like treating them with H minus. This H minus comes in to the carbonyl carbon, thrusts the electrons up onto this oxygen, and gives us this tetrahedral intermediate. Now because these groups, which would be hydrogen if I started with an aldehyde, or an alkyl chain if I started with a ketone. Neither of these groups are good leaving groups, so the minus charge in the oxygen cannot come down and kick them off. Instead, it lingers until I protonate it. And once I do that during my acid quench, it gives me this. If I had started with an aldehyde starting material, then I would have an H here, and this product would be, would be a primary alcohol. If I had started with a ketone, where both of these are carbon chains, then the final product would be a secondary alcohol. Let's now do some problems. I want you to show me how to prepare the following products by reacting an aldehyde or ketone with sodium borohydride. I should advise you that this may be a good place for you to pause the video and attempt these problems on your own first, since I will be momentarily giving you all of the cancers. Ah, uh, I mean answers. So here is the answer to our first question. I want to know how to make this product beginning from an aldehyde or ketone and treating it with sodium borohydride. The way we do this is easy. All we do is convert the oxygen carbon bond here into a double bond. That takes me backwards to this starting material, which is a ketone. Thus, if I took this ketone and treat it with sodium borohydride and an acid quench, I guarantee that it would make this alcohol product. What is the mechanism? Well, remember, sodium borohydride is really just a source of H minus. So when I take this ketone and treat it with sodium borohydride, I'm really reacting it with H minus that goes into this carbonyl carbon and thrusts the electrons up onto this oxygen. That gives me this intermediate. When this intermediate is protonated, it then gives me the final product. Here's the answer to our second problem. I want to know how to make this alcohol from an aldehyde or a ketone using sodium borohydride. Once again, all I do to work backwards to my starting material 
is convert this bond here between the oxygen and carbon into a double bond. If I do that, I start with this aldehyde, which I guarantee upon being treated with sodium borohydride will be converted into this product. What is the mechanism? Once again, we have to remember that sodium borohydride is really a source of H minus. Thus, when I react this aldehyde with sodium borohydride, the H minus hydride comes into this carbonyl carbon, thrusts the electrons up onto that oxygen, and gives me this intermediate. When this intermediate is quenched with acid, it then yields this product. Let's look at our third question. How can I prepare this tertiary alcohol beginning from an aldehyde or a ketone starting material and treating it with sodium borohydride? Well, as it turns out, I can't. This was actually a trick question. Ha ha. <laughs> okay. But the reason I asked you this question is because I wanted you to remember the reactions that we learned in our previous video from this chapter. If I have a tertiary alcohol and I want to make that from an aldehyde or a ketone, what I actually have to do is take a ketone and treat it with a Grignard reagent. So I'm going to take a look at this. I'm going to convert this bond into a double bond in my starting material and get rid of this cyclohexyl group. That gives me this starting material, which is very boring. What is the difference between this starting material and this product? Well, the product has this cyclohexyl group. So what Grignard reagent would I have to introduce? I'd have to introduce cyclohexyl magnesium bromide, shown here. Now remember, cyclohexyl magnesium bromide, as well as all Grignard reagents, really just behave as if there were a minus charge on this carbon bound to the magnesium. That minus charge, when reacted here with this ketone, comes into this carbonyl carbon, thrusting these electrons onto the oxygen and give me this intermediate here. When this intermediate is quenched with acid, it then yields the indicated product. So I want to ask you, what occurs when we add hydride to an acyl chloride? Well, here we have an acyl chloride that I'm reacting with sodium borohydride. The H minus in sodium borohydride comes into the carbonyl carbon and thrusts these electrons up onto the oxygen, giving me this tetrahedral intermediate. Now this is a little different from the tetrahedral intermediate that I would form if I had started with a ketone or an aldehyde here. And the reason is because Cl is a very good leaving group. So what occurs? Well, these uh, electrons up here on this negatively charged oxygen come down here close to form a double bond and kick off the chloride as a leaving group, giving me this aldehyde intermediate. Unfortunately, I can't stop there. What ends up occurring is another molecule of sodium borohydride thrusts another hydride atom into this carbonyl and pumps the electrons up onto this oxygen. That O minus, shown right here, then gets quenched during my uh, acid workup and gives me a final primary alcohol. What's the bottom line for this reaction? Well, I want you to remember that if I take sodium borohydride and react it with an acyl chloride, what ends up happening is two hydride uh, two hydrides come in subsequently and take this acyl chloride all the way down to a primary alcohol. I can't stop at the aldehyde. The aldehyde gets attacked again by hydride and goes all the way to a primary alcohol. So what occurs when I add a hydride reagent to a carboxylic acid? Well, as it turns out, carboxylic acids are not as reactive as acyl chlorides. That's because this OH here is not as good of a leaving group as a Cl. Thus, if you treat a carboxylic acid with sodium borohydride, nothing happens. In other words, sodium borohydride is not a strong enough source of H minus hydride to touch a carboxylic acid. So what do we do? We have to use this reagent, lithium aluminum hydride, which is 
an extremely reactive source of H minus. It's much more potent than sodium borohydride. This slide shows the mechanism traversed when I add lithium aluminum hydride to a carboxylic acid. I really don't want you to focus on the mechanism. I just want you to see that when I take a carboxylic acid and I react it with lithium aluminum hydride, lithium aluminum hydride ultimately adds two H minuses into the carbonyl carbon and takes me all the way down to the primary alcohol. Just as when I react an acyl chloride with sodium borohydride, when I treat a carboxylic acid with lithium aluminum hydride, two hydrides get added into that carbonyl carbon and take me all the way down to the primary alcohol. I also want you to remember that sodium borohydride is not a potent enough source of hydride to reduce a carboxylic acid. In order to reduce a carboxylic acid, I have to use lithium aluminum hydride, which is really an extremely potent source of hydride. So let's now ask, do you think that sodium borohydride will reduce an ester? Well, you might realize that esters having this OCH3 are similar to carboxylic acids. They aren't like an acyl chloride, which has a Cl that's a much better leaving group. So they are also not as reactive as an acyl chloride. What does that mean? Well, it means that sodium borohydride, once again, will not touch an ester usually. So I have to get out the big guns, lithium aluminum hydride, in order to reduce an ester. Just as with a carboxylic acid, lithium aluminum hydride pumps in two hydride uh, atoms to take me all the way to a primary alcohol. It does it by this mechanism. An H minus comes into this carbonyl, thrusting the electrons onto this oxygen, giving me this tetrahedral intermediate. This minus charge comes down to form a double bond and kicks off the OCH3, giving me this aldehyde. Unfortunately, I can't stop at the aldehyde. A second molecule of lithium aluminum hydride will then throw in a second hydride to uh, pump these electrons up here and give me this intermediate. This then gets quenched to go all the way to the primary alcohol. So once again, esters and acyl chlorides and carboxylic acids undergo two successive reactions with hydride to form a primary alcohol. You cannot reduce esters and carboxylic acids using sodium borohydride. You have to use the more reactive lithium aluminum hydride. So what if I have an ester and I only want to reduce it to an aldehyde instead of going all the way to a primary alcohol? Can I do anything about that? Do I have to enlist the help of magical leprechauns? Well, no. What I do is I use this reagent, diisobutyl aluminum hydride, commonly referred to as dibol or dibol H. Di, ball, dibol. When I stir an ester at negative 78 degrees Celsius with dibol followed by water quench, I can selectively only add in one hydride, kick off this OCH3 to stop at the aldehyde rather than going all the way down to the primary alcohol. Isn't that cool? I mean, I know we're probably not going to declare a national holiday over it or anything, but I still think it's pretty neat. Let's go back now to lithium aluminum hydride, but this time we're going to focus on amides. You see, when we react an amide with lithium aluminum hydride, a slightly different product is formed. A primary amine, shown here. The mechanism here shows how that occurs. Once again, I don't want you to worry too much about the mechanism. I just want you to remember that lithium aluminum hydride converts carboxylic acids and esters all the way to primary alcohols, but in contrast, will convert amides down to amines. On a personal note, I just have to tell you how crappy working with lithium aluminum hydride really is. The reason is because it's so stinking reactive. Frequently, 
uh, these reactions will bubble over when you quench them and start fire. That's why we have to quench them at negative 78 degrees Celsius. And even then, they frequently bubble over and catch fire. One day when I was working in uh, the lab during a, one of my previous jobs, a coworker of mine was slowly quenching a lithium aluminum hydride reaction. As frequently occurs, it bubbled over, spilling solvent over, all over the inside of her fume hood. She wiped up that solvent and then threw the paper towel into the trash can. Before we knew it, the trash can started on fire. I ran over to her workbench and grabbed the nearest fire extinguisher, only to realize that in the poorly equipped lab that I worked in at the time, our fire extinguisher was really only a decoration and didn't actually work. If they had painted a picture of a fire extinguisher on the wall, it would have been just as effective. Fortunately, another co-worker of mine grabbed a different, fully functional fire extinguisher that we had and put out the blaze. It was scary, but I'm pleased to report that there were no fatalities, other than my underpants, which had to be destroyed. One other awful thing about lithium aluminum hydride reactions is that when you quench them, they usually smell like poo, much like the underpants of anyone nearby when you start a garbage can on fire in the lab. Because sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, and hydrogen with palladium carbon all have different reactivities toward different functional groups, we can tailor reaction conditions sele to selectively affect, in some instances, only certain parts of the molecule. For example, if I started with this molecule, which you'll notice has a ketone, an alkene, and an ester in it, I can selectively affect only certain parts of this molecule using different conditions. For example, you might remember that sodium borohydride will only reduce ketones and will not reduce esters, and it also will not reduce alkenes. Thus, if I take this material and I treat it with sodium borohydride, it will only reduce the ketone, converting it into a secondary alcohol, and will not touch the ester or the alkene. Separately, if I were to take this starting material and treat it with hydrogen, with palladium, or platinum, the palladium and platinum would hydrogenate or reduce the alkene only. It would not touch the ketone and would not touch the ester. Thus, I could selectively just reduce the alkene. In contrast, if I treat this starting material with lithium aluminum hydride, which is my most potent source of H-, it will reduce both the ketone and the ester, but will not touch the alkene. This will ultimately give me this product. This is very useful information to know when you want to uh, divergently convert a product into multiple, or a starting material, into multiple different products without affecting all of the different portions of the molecule. As you can well imagine, treating a ketone or an aldehyde with a cyanide nucleophile uh, causes a reaction mechanism to occur that's very similar to treating a ketone or aldehyde with hydride, Grignard, or an acetylide. The cyanide nucleophile will come into the carbonyl carbon, thrust these electrons onto the O-, and give me this tetrahedral intermediate. Once this is quenched with acid, in this case, hydrogen cyanide acid, it gives me this kind of intermediate, which is really cool. I have an alcohol that's on a carbon adjacent to a nitrile. Now this feels like a great place for us to end. Please take a quick break and rest your herniated eardrums. I look forward to seeing you shortly for our final and concluding lecture of Chapter 18.